going to go through a little example first with you that hopefully will allow you to see better alpha, beta, and power. And then we'll turn to doing one or two of the questions from the lecture review. So if you want to take notes, you can. If you don't, I have a summary of this already on C-Tools for you. But let's step it through so you can discover and see it too. We're going to pretend like we're CSI. We have a murder suspect. There was a murder that took place in the South Forest. In the South Forest, there's primarily pine trees of a certain species, species B. Species B, South Forest, and that's where the actual murder took place. Same type of pine tree, but species A primarily grow in the North Forest. And that particular species, the pine needle lengths, are much shorter than the other. This particular suspect, we found a pine needle on the coat. We're going to measure its length. The suspect claims that he was walking in the South Forest, that he's, or excuse me, that he's walking in the North Forest, that he's innocent. H not innocent until proven guilty. And we're trying to decide whether we're going to say, no, I think this is a species B, and you were in the South Forest, therefore you're still a suspect or not. So H not that he really was in the North Forest, I can't spell, and H-A, South Forest, we're going to take a pine needle and measure its length. And we have to decide, based on the length, whether we think it's species A or species B. Decision making. Species A, the average length is 10, you know, 10 millimeters or something like that. Average is 10, approximately bell-shaped model, and the standard deviation is two. So they do vary. They're relatively shorter. On average about ten, give or take about two. The other species of this particular type of pine tree has much longer needles. They're still roughly bell-shaped, centered at a much longer value of sixteen, still give or take about two. So what if we measure a pine needle? And what if its length was eight? Eight millimeters. What are you going to decide? Species A or species B? A, right? If it's eight, what if it's 20? B, right? What if it's 10? Still stick with A? Because that's the average of A. How about 12? When it's 12, are you going to be convinced that it's B yet, or are you going to stick with A? Probably still A? Mm -hmm. Now if you get into 13 or 14, are you starting to show more evidence to say it might be B? So you've got to come up with a rule. You've got to pick a cut and say, if that pine needle length is this length or larger, I'm going to say he was really in the South Forest. Reject H0. So we've got to come up with a rule. Then we're going to evaluate how well that rule would perform, how often would we make a type 1 or type 2 error, how powerful is that decision-making process for that particular rule that you pick. So what do you think? We, 12, we were still thinking of A. What about 14? I like that cut because it's at the standard deviation mark. Are you OK with this rule? If you get a 14 or larger, we're going to be convinced it's of species B instead of A. Is that okay? Reasonable rule. So 14 or larger, we're going to reject H0. If it's less than 14, we fail to reject H0. We have come up with our decision rule. It's similar to the one we did in class last week. If you got a white ball, we were going to reject H0. If you got a red ball, we were going to stay with the red and white ball example. Two very specific models, H0 versus HA. Here's a rule that makes reasonable sense. Let's see how well it would perform. So I want to find out how often would you make a type 1 error. With this rule, what would be the probability that you will, what's type 1 error? Reject H0 when? When H0 is true. Okay. I'll keep the purple here. So alpha, right? That's the probability of a type 1 error. Alpha is not the type 1 error. 
the type 1 error is rejecting H0 when H0 is true. The probability of that happening before you look is called alpha, the significance level. So what is that again? You said it was rejecting H0 when H0 is really true. So where does that occur in my picture? It's a probability, so it's an area under one of these curves. It's an area under the curve when H0 is true, so it's under the first curve. And I want to find the chance of rejecting H0 <coughs> when really you're still from H0. So that's the chance of getting 14 or higher under our first little picture here. This is visually alpha, that probability. Would you be able to find that probability? Can you even find it with the empirical rule for me? Tell me what it is about. One more, two standard deviations above the mean. Two standard deviations, 95% in the middle, leaves 5% total in both tails. So this one's about 2.5%. And that's a pretty nice small level alpha. All right. Find for me beta. The probability of making the other mistake. So beta is the probability of a type 2 error. What is a type 2 error defined as again? failing to reject H0, staying with H0, when which model is really correct? HA. All right, so I need that probability. So if HA is true, and this is the actual model that you're picking your pine needle from for its length, and I want to find the chance of failing to reject H0 when HA is really true, and that would be when I get less than 14. So that shaded area to the left of 14, the, the HA model, is beta. <coughs> Could you find that probability for me too? And if it works with the empirical rule, I'm going to accept those answers without getting a z-score and going to the table and getting the exact area. This is now one standard deviation below, so 68% in the middle that leaves 32% altogether. So how much is here? About 16%. And that's maybe a little large, but it's reasonable. OK, what's related to beta? What's the other term? Power. Power is the probability of correctly rejecting H0. Rejecting H0 when you should. Because HA is really true. Power is the probability of rejecting H0 when HA really is true. Sometimes called correctly rejecting H0. Alpha is the probability of incorrectly rejecting H0 because you rejected it when you shouldn't have. And where is power? You know it's 1 minus beta. It's the complement of beta. And indeed, power would be this part of the HA curve. And it's not then 16%, it's about 84%. Can you now see that alpha and beta are not complements of each other, but they do go in opposite direction? If you keep Everything the same about the problem, same sample size, you don't change that. So this is your H0 and HA. You change this line, the cut. Someone says, well, I'll be convinced even if it's 13. So you move your line to the left and put it at 13. What happens to alpha? It gets bigger. What happens to beta? And if beta is smaller, what happens to power? So if alpha were a little larger, if you move the line to the left, so alpha, the chance of making a type 1 error, increases. Moving the line to the left is also going to increase power. 
So the researcher that was trying to decide between 5% versus 10% for alpha, which one actually ends up giving you a larger power? The 10%, the larger alpha. You don't want to have your chance of a type 1 error to be really big, but maybe 10% is still acceptable. And by taking 10% for alpha over 5%, I'll have more alpha and therefore more power. All right? Now, the other thing that influences power is what? What's the other thing that the researcher can decide for designing the study that might influence power? Sample size. And you know that if you have a larger sample size, power should go up. You just learned a little bit ago, because this is a quantitative response, this is a measure of the length of a pine needle, so it's a quantitative response, but X bar, if you took two pine needles, found two of them, and measured both of them and averaged them, the standard deviation when you have a larger sample size is sigma over square root of n, so it gets smaller. So these two curves would change if you take a larger sample size. They'd still be centered at 10 and 16, but respectively, each of those two curves would have less standard deviation. So imagine those two curves being squished, but your decision rule's the same. So if I take a larger sample size and I keep this line the same, the curves are narrower. Can you see that alpha and beta would both be smaller by taking a larger sample size? You could gain actually with both alpha and beta. Or if you decide to keep alpha to be the same, if you still want it to be two and a half percent, you'd have to, you'd be able to move your line over to the left. And if you move it over to the left, what's going to happen to power? All right, so larger sample size leads to higher power too. Now, what we haven't done yet is we haven't measured that pine needle to make our decision. So let's measure it. And it's 15. So if it's 15, what's your decision? Are you going to reject H0 or stay with H0? Here's your needle. It's right here, 15. It's in the reject H0 part of my decision rule. I observed 15. I'm going to reject H0. I'm rejecting it because it's more than 14, 14 or more. What would be its p-value? You can't get a p-value until you've made your observation. P-value is what? The probability of getting what you did get for your test statistic. Here it's just measuring my one response, 15. Getting what you did get for something more extreme, assuming H0 is true. So assuming H0 is true, use that top curve. Find for me the probability of getting what we did get, 15 or larger. You'd be able to find that probability. It would be the area to the right of 15. If that's my p-value, how does that compare to alpha? It's smaller. Whenever you observe 14 or higher, you're going to reject H0. Whenever you observe 14 or higher and you compute the p-value, that p-value is going to be less than or equal to alpha. So the rule we use is reject H0 if your p-value is less than or equal to alpha. And we can use that rule for every test. Otherwise, you've got to draw each picture. You've got to figure out the cut. And that cut for here is 14. A cut for some other problem is 27. I mean, you have to define the rule based on each individual problem with whatever is being measured. And that gets to be very complicated. So why not just always have the probability, the p-value, be computed at the end so that the rule that you use to make your decision with that is universal across all testing problems you do. We're comparing the areas, the p-value to alpha, rather than comparing the values on the axes, which for different problems will be different values. So we just compare the areas, which make it a common base. All right. P-value would be small. So your universal rule, don't get it backwards. Get it backwards, you get things wrong. Right? A couple places on the exam. Don't give you consistency for that. P-value less than or equal to alpha u, reject H0. If you did reject H0, you might have made a mistake. Which one? Type 1 error. If your decision is to stay with H0, again, it's either right or wrong. If it's wrong, it's called a type 2 error.
Question? Well, I can respectively compare 15 to 14 on the axes, or I can compare the area to the right of 15 and the area to the right of 14, which is comparing the p-value to alpha. So I'm going to always find the p-value for every problem and just compare it to alpha. By you picking 14 initially when I said what should be our rule that we use, you've effectively picked your alpha, and you can find the alpha that goes with it. If you wanted alpha to be 5% for sure, you'd have to figure out where does that line need to be so I get 5% in the upper tail. And that would end up being 1.645 standard deviations above the mean. All right, I hope that picture helps put a few things in perspective. It's similar to the red and white ball basket one, and I think there's one old exam that has something like this too, with two specific models where you can calculate alpha, beta, and power.